Right, thanks, thanks, Song. Uh, thanks, Jordan and Mariella. Um, of course, real, real pleasure to always talk uh, at these these events. So, yeah, as Song said today, I'm going to uh, describe some of the work that we do on fuse silica suspensions. Um, and of course, Glasgow is um, kind of one of these unique places where we we are a sort of centre of excellence for um, kind of all kind of gravitational wave activities, both on the data analysis, and the instrumentation, and the hardware side. Um, in terms of suspension work, then. Glasgow has, has led uh, the development of the monolithic stages and the quadruple dependent suspensions for advanced LIGO. And of course, those, those suspensions are essential for improving the low frequency noise performance to make the first detections. Uh, we also do a lot of work on uh, thin suspensions. So we work with uh, end users, um, certainly in Germany and uh, Australia, to uh, provide thin fibers for. Uh, lighter suspensions, 100 gram suspensions, um, and uh, we also kind of pioneering activities into cryogenic suspensions, and that's for, for next generation devices such as the Einstein Telescope, Cosmic Explorer, LIGO Voyager. So um, we, we kind of cover all the bases of, uh, of, of these uh, suspension activities. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, so uh, I'll go through this very quickly, but um, suspension requirements and some of the key noise sources. Uh, so, you know, why do we need to make these suspensions out of uh, fused silica here? And why is fused silica such a fantastic material? So why do all second generation instruments um, and room temperature upgrades utilize fused silica? Um, talk a little bit about dilution and thermal noise, and then talk about some of the work that we've been doing in probably the last year, really, on, on some characterization of um, that pulling machine and also just a, a brief sort of excerpt on the on the performance of the uh, the LIGO suspensions which do display um, probably some of the highest mechanical quality factors ever measured in terms of the violin modes uh, so we'll see that these truly are you know very low low dissipation low loss mechanical systems and that in, in, a, in a sense drives down the the uh, thermal noise all right, so in terms of uh, suspensions, um, well, that's the kind of uh, inventory of, of suspensions in LIGO. And so each one of these components has to be suspended. Um, so there's a variety of different types of suspensions. So on the left here, we've got what we call triple suspensions. Um, the output of the interferometer has to have a, a single stage suspension. And then the core optics in the arms here have these four stage quadruple pendulum suspensions, and, and this is really what Glasgow leads the development of and, and the UK has developed for advanced LIGO. Uh, so we'll see a lot more about these, but it's just to show you that although I'm going to focus on fused silica in the, uh, in the final stage in, um, of the, uh, the quadruple pendulum suspension, all of those optics there have to have some form of suspension. And of course, the ones further, further on the input um, can have less requirements. Uh, so that's a little bit more detailed. So that's kind of really what LIGO starts to look like. Uh, so here the laser comes in, the light sort of rattles around this triangular cavity, and that's what's called a mode cleaner cavity. So that spatially filters the light. Um, and of course, those mirrors have to be suspended, because if they're not, you just couple seismic noise into your, into your laser um, output. Uh, then the, the uh, signal goes around through this Faraday isolator into the power recycling cavity. Again, those are all suspended. So these are triple stage suspensions, three stages of, of uh, isolation. And then into the beam splitter, that's also triple suspension. And then into the main core optics. And of course, these ones, these sort of light blue, you can see here with the, um, these are the test mass quadruple pendulum suspensions. So these are the ones that we'll really focus on today. Um, and then of course the light comes out. So this is the signal recycling arm. So the sidebands that come out of the interferometer, so the gravitational wave sidebands, um, these can be re-injected if we want the, to, to hunt for a specific signal. Although the detector is really operating broadband at the moment, there is the possibility of, of doing more narrowband searching. And then there's the output mode cleaner, which is um, a double stage suspension. Um, so this, this carries the photodiode that we, that we finally look at the signal. Um, so, so this is, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff a lot of suspensions in, in, this, uh, in this kind of interferometer. And then say the ones sort of out here and the ones down here, these can all be made out of just metal and, and maybe a combination of two and three stage of isolation. The ones in, in, in the core optics, 
have to be made um, four stages, and the final stage has to be made out of few silica. Um, so what does a suspension do? Well, really the suspension's job, um, from, a, from a fundamental noise point of view, is to support an optic, but to minimize thermal noise. So anything with dissipation, mechanical dissipation, gives rise to thermal noise, just like a, a resistor gives rise to voltage thermal noise, and mechanical dissipation in, in the material gives rise to a fluctuating force noise. So we have to minimize the thermal noise, and we also, the suspensions do a huge job of reducing um, the seismic noise. So when we look at the ground motion, which typically can be 10 to minus 11 at the, at the site, meters per root hertz, we need to get to 10 to minus 19. So we need about a factor of maybe a 100 million or, or even a, a 10 to the 9, a billion isolation of the ground motion. And about a factor of 1,000 comes up from, from, a, from an in-stage active passive isolation platform. And a factor of a million actually comes from the suspension itself. So, so we do, the suspensions do a big job of, of seismic noise reduction. Um, we also need to be able to damp the, the suspension, so we don't want all the ob objects or the optics wobbling about. So we call this local control, and we'll see this later. And then we also have to um, align the, the interferometer along the four kilometer arm length. So we have to align it with length and pitch and, and yaw, and this is what we call global control. So we have to have actuators to be able to move the, the, uh, the interferometer optics by tiny, tiny amounts, maybe 10 to minus 18 of a meter. Um, we also uh, need the suspension to be an, an interface to the isolation system. Um, and when there's earthquakes, and we see quite a few earthquakes at Hanford, um, we need the, the suspension to uh, you know, support the optic and, and uh, constraints against any damage. So we don't want it to break. That's the requirements. Um, in terms of numbers, then um, we need uh, 10 to minus 19 meters per root hertz in the, the longitudinal, so the pendulum. And then if the mirror here is bouncing up and down, so there's vertical to horizontal um, or longitudinal coupling at about a factor of 0.1%, so we need 10 to minus 16 meters per root hertz in the vertical. So we do need a lot of vertical isolation as, as well. And then of course the seismic noise is the same level. It doesn't make sense to make something that's got much better thermal noise, but is limited still by seismic. So the, the requirements for thermal and seismic noise are, are both 10 to minus 19 meters per root hertz. And then some requirements on the angle angle centering. Um, that's less of a, a challenge. The, the, the major challenge is this 10 to minus 19 longitudinal requirements. Uh, so that's what advanced LIGO looks like. Um, so it's, it was a big step up from initial LIGO. Uh, so initial LIGO just had some um, passive isolation stacks here, and it had a single loop of, of uh, wire supporting a 10.7 kilogram optic. Um, well, advanced LIGO, so, so this is one of the, the, what's called a BSC chamber, or basic symmetric chamber. And the, the vacuum chamber is not shown here, but it would be sort of coming around, tracing it out a little bit like this. Um, so this is the ground, of course. These are four um, kind of fairly substantial piers that kind of lift up from the ground. There's some, what we call, hydro hydraulic uh, external pre-isolator. Um, so, so the, the hydraulic external pre-isolators are sitting on the, the, the piers. Um, so they provide some reduction of um, seismic noise at low frequency. They also move the optic, um, the entire system around by about half a millimeter. Um, and that's to take account of the fact that we see earth tides in the interferometer. So we see strain in the earth due to the, the moon and sun. Uh, and that changes by about 400 microns twice per day. Then um, there's these two um, bellows that, that um, provide these cross, cross beams that go into the vacuum. There's a two-stage active passive isolation system here. So active at low frequency, passive above maybe a couple of hertz. And then hanging underneath that is this quadruple pendulum suspension. So that's what the UK has, has developed and, and delivered to, to advanced LIGO. And then the lower stage of that is purely made out of glass. So that's the optic, which is this one here. And this is what's called the penultimate mass, which is this one here on the right. Um, and these are both 40 kilograms of fused silica, optical quality fused silica, and they're suspended by fused silica fibers. So we have bonding of ears on the side of the test mass, and then we actually draw fibers with a pulling machine, and then we weld those fibers in situ in place. And that's in, in order to make this out of an entire piece of glass is to drive down the, the thermal noise performance. 
Um, so my, to, to meet this goal of 10 to minus 19 meters uh, per root hertz. And then above that, we'll see there's other stages. So there's another two stages, and these are both metal stages sitting above here, which you can just about see there. So there's one stage. So that's the first stage, second stage, third stage, and then the final stage, the fourth stage. So these two stages here, these are made out of metal, and they can have metal wires because you get filtering of the final stage of any thermal noise produced by the, the metal suspension wires high up in the suspension chain. Um, and indeed, the, the, the coupling between that, that metal stage and the first glass stage is actually a set of a pair of metal wires. You can just about see, um, but it's taken there, it says steel suspension wires leading to upper metal stages. So, so there's a loop of wire that comes around the optic and goes up to the, the suspension stage up, up here. And even though there's thermal noise in that wire, uh, which is worse, maybe about a factor of uh, a thousand than, uh, than the, the fused silica, you've got this final suspension stage that, that filters out that thermal noise. Um, there's an interesting question, of course, you know, why, why multiple stages? Uh, so why do we need four stages of, of, of isolation? Um, and, and you can see that by thinking about what happens with a, with a single pendulum or a double pendulum. And then, of course, you can extend that to um, three or four pendulum suspensions. So if I take my single pendulum sus suspension of length L um, and I say, what happens now as I, as I shake the ground? So maybe imagine shaking the ground backwards and forwards. So what will happen is this pendulum mode will get excited. But of course, we can do that as a function of frequency. Uh, so at very low frequency, as we push the ground backwards and forwards, the pendulum just moves backwards and forwards with the ground. Um, then, of course, we can drive at resonance, and the, the, the shaking becomes quite a lot. So you can see this here on this transfer function plot um, of magnitude of signal versus frequency. So I'm not plotting the phase here, just the, the gain of the transfer function. But essentially, at low frequency, the ground and the pendulum move together. Then you've got the resonance. So here's a single resonance of the blue one. And then above the resonance, of course, the ground can shake, but the inertia of the pendulum means that it doesn't really want to move. So the ground can shake more and the pendulum's not moving so much. So of course, above the resonance, this drops as one over omega squared up until the point you hit a internal mode of the suspension, then this flattens out. And um, now what happens if you take two pendula and you couple them together, but of the same total length? So, so each of them have, has a length of L by two. And um, then what happens there, of course, is you see two resonant modes because the pendulum can, can do, they can do this um, or they can do this. So they've got two eigen modes or two eigen frequencies. So you two, see two peaks. Of course, at low frequency, they, they again, they, the ground as it moves backwards and forwards, the pendulum is just, just track. But the interesting thing is above the resonant frequencies, so above the body modes here, which is kind of about here, then you start to see this drop off, but it drops off much sharper. So if this drops off like one over F squared, this drops off like one over F to the four. So this is the reason why you have multiple suspensions um, or multiple pendulum elements, because you get this isolation factor between the mass and the ground of the resonant frequency, which might be one and a half hertz or a couple of hertz, divided by the operating point, which may be 10 hertz, that's where LIGO starts, to the power of 2n, where n is the number of stages. So for one stage, it goes like 1 over f squared. For two stages, f to the 4. For quadruple pendulum suspension, it's 1 over f to the 8. So you can see here that if we have a body modes um, over here around 1.5 to, to 2, 3 hertz, by the time you get to 10 hertz, which is where LIGO starts here, you're well into this 1 over f to the 8 regime. And 1.5 over 10 to the 8 is about um, three, one over three million. So you can start to see that you can get factors of million isolation from seismic noise by having four pendulum stages. So that's the reason we have four is because we need to, to, to meet this, this rather challenging requirement of seismic noise. Um, and, and of course, it's because of the ground shakes, this becomes the next quite platform for this stage, and then this becomes a platform for the next stage, and, and so on. It's a multiplicative effect. Um, so that's seismic noise. What about thermal noise? So of course there's there's KT of energy um, in, uh, in 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 the uh, the suspension elements, and 
we, we're quite used, I think, to, to thinking about um, resonant modes. Uh, so if we think about the, the pendulum mode that we've just looked at, and it swings backwards and forwards, then it will have a, a, a peak in the, in the spectrum. And then there might be an internal mode, which is due to the mirror. And that also has quite a sharp peak in the spectrum. And that KT of energy is distributed across the, the frequency spectrum. So although for LIGO, we can't do anything about the fact that we've got KT of energy stored in the, in the suspension, um, the only way you reduce that is by going to low temperature, but LIGO is not going to do that. So the question is, how do you meet the, the, the requirements of thermal noise when you use materials with extremely high quality factor or extremely low mechanical loss? Um, and what that essentially says is that when the mechanical loss is extremely low, you put most of that KT of energy into the resonant mode. So if there's a KT of energy in the pendulum mode and you have a very sharp resonance, most of that energy goes into the pendulum mode, which means if I integrate across the spectrum, if I've got KT of total energy and most of it's in the pendulum mode, then the off resonance thermal noise must be lower than the black one, which is a lower mechanical loss. So this tells you why we go for fused silica in the final stage is because it's got an exquisite low mechanical loss. You know, less than 10 to minus 7 is the loss angle. And that means that um, most of the energy is stored in the resonant modes. And of course, we can damp those resonant modes with electrostatic uh, or, or magnetostatic control. And then the off resonance thermal noise is lower. So this is a way of, it's not bypassing thermodynamics. It's just telling us where we put the energy in the, in the suspension. So most of it's sitting in you know, the violin modes or the internal modes of the mirror or the pendulum mode of the suspension. And that's where we operate the detector is between you know, 10 Hertz and a few kilohertz, which is where we're sitting in this, in this low off resonance thermal noise. Uh, so that's what the quad looks like. Um, and we'll kind of take the frame off in a, in a minute. Um, you can see there the test mass, the penultimate mass, and here's the other two masses. So let's take the frame off. That's the difference. Um, so you can see here test mass, penultimate mass. There's the second metal stage, and there's a the first metal stage, and this would be ground or the, the isolation platform. Um, so you can see that the seismic isolation. So we've already said we use four pendulums one, two, three, and four down to the test mass. Um, but we also have to use some vertical isolation. So there's these vertical, what are cantilever springs that bounce up and down. So there's one set in here, that's stage one. There's a set in here, stage two, and there's a final set you can just see poking out here. Three sets of vertical isolation. And that's because there's 0.1% coupling of vertical ground motion to longitudinal, partly because these interferometer over four kilometer, it's the curvature of the earth. And the curvature of the earth means that the, the suspensions would want to hang like you see my hands, but of course we need to make a cavity. So as the ground goes vertical, then there's a longitudinal to vertical coupling. Um, so we have to have vertical isolation and that's provided by these springs. Um, we do the thermal noise reduction by having the final stage of fused silica. Um, and then of course, uh, what you can see here, this yellow mass, this is another chain to the hanging parallel behind the main suspension chain. So this is the main optic but there's another suspension hanging behind it. And you might say, well, why on earth do you do that? And um, well, that's of course, because when we want to apply forces onto these quiet reference frames, so these are some of the quiet reference frames in the, in, in the world, 10 to minus 19, you don't want to attach a, an actuator that's sitting on the ground that's moving a million times more than that. So you hang a chain behind and you push off this quiet reference chain. Um, so that's how we do the control. Um, this is just looking now just at the, the final stage. So there's the final optic stage with the, um, the main test mass, the penultimate mass. There's the metal wires that come and hang the suspension from the, the metal stages above. And then these are the few silica fibers um, that we'll, we'll have a look at. And these are the ears that we call. Um, so these are hydroxide catalysis bonded. So it's glass to glass bonding, um, but with low mechanical loss and uh, good strength. Uh, and this is glass, and it allows us to actually weld the fibers in, in place. Um, so this, remember we talked a little bit about local and global control. Um, so local control, remember, is, well, there's our suspensions on the bottom right. So that's our main suspension, that's the optic. And this is our reference suspension. So we push off uh, this one and we push on, on the, the main chain. Um, so these yellow, these are magnets. So we have magnet coil actuators on on most of the stages. 
and the yellow ones are just damping the, the top mass. And there's enough of them that we can sense. So of course, this has 24 degrees of freedom. So each suspension has six degrees of freedom. So three translations and three rotations. Uh, so there's four stages, so there must be 24 modes in there. And we can sense 22 out of the 24 modes right from the top. And, and that we can sense those because of the, the way that we've got the, the wires attached between the suspension stages. So we can see um, most of the modes. The only, the only ones we don't see of the optic are the, the roll mode and the bounce mode. Um, but all the other ones we see up here, and by applying forces, we can actually extract energy out of all of those 22 modes. So this is called local damping. So we have local damping on the main chain, local damping on the reaction chain, and then we've got these sort of red magnets and green magnets, and the red and the green, as you go down the chain, they get smaller. So they're either 10 by 10 magnets or 2 by 6 magnets. And, and these are, are to apply the global control. So these actually move the... The, the, the main mirror of the interferometer, they can pitch it, yaw it, move it, translate it, and these are for global control. And then finally, there's an electrostatic actuator at the test mass where we can apply um, electrostatic um, high voltage on, on, the, uh, on the reaction chain and apply micronewton um, sort of forces to, to do the fine adjustments. So as, so as you go down the chain, the forces get smaller and smaller because you need to apply less and less control. We try and do that make mo most of the control high up in the suspension chain. Um, well, that's zooming in now on the on one of the ears. That's a, a bottom ear, like a Hanford. Um, and you know, these are these are beautiful things. Um, just looking at them, uh, this you can see here the ear, which is um, bonded. Dr. Katas is bonded, so it's an optically clear bond as well. Um, and you can see the the horns of the ear here, and you can see the ends of the fiber. So the ends of the fiber are three millimeter diameter. So that's the stock that we pull the fiber from. And you can see here that the, the fiber sort of neck down, and this is 800 microns here, and then it goes to 400 microns a little bit further out of the picture. And it stays 400 microns for most of the, the thickness of the fiber. And at the top end of the suspension, 600 millimeters away, there's another one of these, but the other way around. Uh, and you can see that we do the welding of the few silica. Um, and you can tell here we've welded a little bit more material in here, so it's kind of bulged out a little bit more. But that's one of the things we do in Glasgow is, is welding of, of fuse silica to make these monolithic suspensions. Um, let's see if this works. This is the fiber pulling machine. It might be a little bit jumpy on the, on the webinar, but this is one of the machines you have in Glasgow. There's another one in, in Hanford and another one in, uh, in Virgo. So we heat the, the, the fuse silica um, with a spinning mirror to get uniform heating. And then you can see this arm that's sort of pulling out the top. So we make the silica molten and then we pull and the speed that we pull the fiber, you can see here the, the heating of the fuse silica, it's molten here, and then the arm pulls out and then this mirror that you can see, that this gold mirror, drops down slowly to, to create new, new molten material. So it's a, it's a feed pull type technique, very similar to making lots of fibers. Um, but the challenge with this is that there's a start and stop. So when you pull an optic fiber, you keep going for kilometers so the transients aren't a challenge, but here the fact that you're pulling a fiber out, um, you have to be quite careful about the speed profile that you you, you pull the, um, the, uh, the 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 motor with. Otherwise, you get sort of oscillations in the fiber diameter or thinning of the fiber. So there's a there's a lot of work that goes into optimizing the profile. Um, a couple of pictures of of the, the the real things installed. So of course these got installed back in 20, 2013 to twenty. Um, um, maybe 14. Uh, so this is in Hanford here, and the, the whole suspension gets attached to the seismic isolation. Everything gets craned into the into the main the main tank, and there you can just about see the few silica fibers from one of the suspensions going up. Um, why so? Why few silica? Uh, well, it's a remarkable material. Um, it's extremely strong, so it's got a very high um, tensile strength. Uh, so if you look here, this is some data we, we, we took, we've taken for a variety of diameters of fiber. Um, and you can see the breaking stress, certainly the thin ones up to, to this, you know, sort of few hundred microns, these are sort of four to five gigapascals. So these are, these are extremely strong um, fibers. Uh, so they're very uniform. So, so they, don't, they don't yield until they, they fracture because it's a, a brittle material. 
um, but the fractures are very high stress. And, and the, what, the reason why these are has got more scatter is actually because as you start to make thicker fibers, the, 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 the break doesn't always happen in the fiber. So you can see here a high speed photograph of um, a fiber break. So you can see that the, the glass sort of just shatters. It's an explosive fracture because of the energy. And actually sometimes when you get really um, strong fibers, so, so at this point, these are breaking at about 80 to 100 kilograms. And you start to break in the stock material. So, so, so sometimes if the stock is not, the stock is less strong than the fiber, even though it's 10 times um, larger diameter. Because these fibers are a pristine material. So, so it's a remarkable material. And just to, to show, show you, um, so Young's modulus is stress over strain. So if we've got um, an advanced LIGO fiber, which is 10 kilograms on each fiber, so 40 kilogram test mass, four fibers, uh, 400 micron diameter fiber at 60 centimeters long. The stress is 700, 800 megapascal. Um, the extension, which is strain times the, the, the length, is just the ratio of the stress to Young's modulus times the length of the suspension. It stretches by six millimeters. So it's about 1% strain at nominal load. And, and often when you look at metals, you know, the standard is to look at 0.2% strain. So these are, these are actually highly stressed systems, but they're still actually in, in, a, in a purely linear regime. Uh, this just shows you an explosive factor. So we got two fibers here to test a upper suspension. And this was probably applying a load of 140 kilograms. And what you see here with a high speed camera is you see um, the explosive fracture where one of them breaks and there's a shock wave that goes down into the fiber that shatters that causes the other fiber to, to break so so of course you don't want that to happen in a real suspension but we do actually prove these up to um, their ultimate tensile strength so at this point the the this was about four gigapascals so this was six percent of strain so that means a 20 centimeter fiber was stretching by about one centimeter so uh, and just pause a moment to, to think about that but these are extremely elastic materials, even though it's glass. Um, so we operate with a safety factor of about seven because we operate at 10 kilos, but they can break at 70 to, to 80 kilos. Um, well, just to finish off with talking about silica. Um, it's a remarkable material. Um, it's got you know, low mechanical loss, um, but it's still not quite good enough if you just went in and, and, and uh, utilize it in a, in a suspension. We have to use this technique called dissipation dilution um, and, and what we do there is we play the game that we don't store all the energy in the elasticity of the material. So we actually store some of the energy uh, in, in gravity. Um, so if we think about this pendulum suspension here, this four wire pendulum suspension, um, if I push that pendulum suspension backwards and forwards, then actually what it does um, is, is as it sort of moves backwards and forwards, of course the suspension lifts. And, and within four wires, it actually parallel translates. Um, so to have a good example here, but well, there, there's a this there's a, a coaster. Um, but but a normal pendulum with a single wire would just sort of do this. Um, but because it's got four wires or two on each side, it parallel translates. So what it does is it actually just goes up like like this. So it stays. This doesn't tilt, but it stays. And it sort of moves backwards and forwards like this. But as you as you sort of push this pendulum backwards and forwards, it's actually lifting in the gravitational field. Um, so, so what we're saying is that some of that energy um, is stored in the bending of the material, but actually some of it, because the, the pendulum is moving up and down in the gravitational field, uh, some of the energy is stored in, in gravity. And gravity, or gravitational potential energy, is lossless. Um, bending energy in the material is lossy because it depends on the, the, the intrinsic mechanical loss in the fibers. Um, so what we try to do is store as much energy as possible in gravity and not much in elasticity. Um, and the way you do that is you make um, high tension fibers with, with a thin diameter. So you push the stress up in the fibers. Um, so what we find is that in a, in, a, in a loaded LIGO suspension, this dilution, the ratio of how much energy is in gravity to elasticity, uh, is the ratio of the spring constants. And, and the gravitational spring constant just mg over L. Um, the elastic spring constant is a little bit more complicated, but it depends on the tension and it depends on this second moment of area. So this is R to the, to the power four, depends on the Young's modulus and, and also the length. Um, so what you find is by having long suspensions, um, making this number large means that more energy is stored in gravity. It means that 
K gravity dominates. So you make the suspensions long, you make the stress quite high, or you make the radius quite quite thin. So that's why we push to long thin fibers operating at you know seven percent um, of their of their fracture strength. Um, and when we do that, then we see about 98, 99% of the energy stored in gravity and about one, one and a half percent is stored in elasticity or in, in the fused silica. So what we find is any mechanical loss that we see in the fused silica, we can then reduce that by about a factor of 100 and say that actually the amount of um, lossy um, elastic energy that's causing thermal noise is 100 times lower than, than, than our intrinsic fused silica. So we might start at 10 to minus 7, in terms of intrinsic fused silica, the actual mechanical loss of the real fibers is 10 to minus nine. And that's what gets you to these Q fact quality factors of about a billion. So, so we have to play this game to get the, the ultimate performance. Um, so it's a remarkable material, but it doesn't quite get you there. You, you need to play um, the, the game of thin suspension fibers. Um, now, if you do that, we, you've got a, a very well-developed model. I haven't gone through it in a lot of detail today, um, but there are these key um, loss terms. Uh, and these go into the fluctuation dissipation theorem that we see here. And this plots out the thermal noise of the different modes. Um, so here's 10 hertz, and this is displacement noise meters per root hertz. And you can see this is the requirement for LIGO, the black line. And this is our estimate of the, um, the, the uh, thermal noise due to the pendulum mode. This is the thermal noise due to the vertical mode. So you see the vertical mode's got a resonance around nine hertz, and that's because the suspension fiber is bouncing up and down. And then that's the pendulum mode. Uh, so that's a very sharp resonance. So off resonance at 10 hertz meets the requirement. Uh, and then we also think about the bond loss due to the ears and also the violin mode losses, which are much, much smaller. So that you can see here that we do meet the requirements. Um, and we're thinking about the key loss terms. So surface loss is important. So this is just due to um, sort of a, 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 it can be dislocations in the, in the fused silica, could be dangling bonds, could be even micro cracks. So all silica fibers display a surface loss that depends on the ratio of the surface to volume ratio. Um, we also have thermoelastic loss. So as the fiber kind of bends backwards and forwards, then there's heat flow across the fiber and that creates um, a, a loss term and that's called thermoelastic loss. Uh, that creates dissipation. And then at the weld point that we saw earlier, we, we have heat infused silica that's stressed. So we also have weld loss. And we put all those into the model, we get the, uh, the, the, the total loss performance, and then that goes into the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Um, just moving on, just to show you the shape of the fibers. So we, remember, we start at three millimeters at the end. We then have a short section that goes to 800 microns. And then the majority of the fiber, about sort of 550 millimeters of it, is 400 microns. So most of the bending takes place here because it's a stretched fiber. Um, and you might say, well, why on earth do you make it 800 microns and then make it 400 for the rest of the fiber? Well, it has to be 400 for most of the fiber because this vertical mode has to be soft enough. So you have to make it 400 microns. Um, but the reason we need 800 microns at the end is to cancel um, this thermoelastic loss. So as we see here, the thermoelastic loss, another remarkable property of fused silica is that the thermoelastic loss depends on the thermal expansion coefficient and the, the stress in the fiber. And this beta is the, the essentially um, the rate of change of Young's modulus with temperature. So it's dy by dt. Um, and you can see that actually in principle, you can cancel these. Um, and you can cancel it for silica. You can't cancel it for any other material. And you can cancel it for silica because silica has got a remarkable property that as the temperature increases, it gets stiffer. Um, whereas every metal, as the temperature increases, it gets softer. So, so, so the, the, the curious thing with, with fused silica is that um, as you increase its temperature, it gets longer due to alpha, but because the Young's modulus gets stiffer, then the strain due to the Young's modulus causes the fiber to contract. Um, so if you have a heavily loaded suspension fiber and you heat it, it actually gets shorter. So that's a, an interesting property of fused silica. So we use that to actually null and cancel the thermoelastic noise. And you can't do that with any other material. So another reason why fused silica is a, is a fantastic material. So you can see here that most of the energy is a plot of bending energy versus length along the fiber. This is where the weld is. So when we do finite element analysis to estimate the thermal noise, we look at the energy contribution in the fiber. 
So there's some energy stored in the weld region. Most of the energy is stored in the bending of the fiber. So that's where the, the fiber is bending backwards and forwards. And that's in this eight, 800 micron section. And then the 400 micron section has very, very little energy stored in it. And that's because we, we don't want the energy stored there. Um, just to give you a couple of highlights of papers so that you can go and take a little bit more reading. Um, this is something published um, not long ago, um, maybe a month or two ago. Um, this was sort of the lowest observed surface and weld losses in few circuit fibers. Um, so we measured cues of up to a billion or a few billion in, in the, the violin mode of LIGO. And this means that if one of these modes gets rung up, they ring for about four or five days at 500 hertz. So we rung up with the, with the suspension and the first sort of eight modes. And you see a scatter in the quality factors, but the actual measure, the highest quality factor observed are these little crosses here, which are these ones here. And then this green line is the best fit to our data. So although we see a, we, we see a scatter, we, we take the highest observed quality factor because there's lots of things out there that will actually make the quality factor lower, like coupling to other modes, depending on the suspension state. So the highest quality factor is the, the one that we take. And then we fitted the data to this. <coughs> and then we, we, we looked at the, um, the effective surface loss and weld loss in the suspension. But these are remarkable. You know, the fact that we see queues of, of two to two, two billion is telling us that, that really is, is an extremely low loss mechanical system. Uh, this is our fiber pulling machine. So this is the Glasgow machine. So we can see that we've upgraded it and we've put a longer ball screw in here. So this allows us to pull up to um, two meter fibers. Um, we've done a lot of work on improving the, um, the stabilization. So we, this is the mirror that we saw earlier, but we have some cameras here. So you see cameras, there's one here, and there's actually one installed on, on the, the left here, as a CO2 laser. And what we do is we, we look at the outputs of, the, um, of the, the brightness of the stock with the camera, and we use this to feed back and control the, the, uh, the power of the laser, because the laser, the CO2 laser fluctuates in power quite significantly. So if you control the power, we can get better performance. And, and you can see here, um, well, here the blue is the intensity of coming out of the camera, and then the red or the brown is the fiber diameter. So there's a correlation between fiber diameter and power in the laser, possibly sometimes because you're evaporating material as the power goes up and down, and also the viscosity of the glass changes as, as you pull. Um, so we, we, we want to stabilize this better, and CO2 la lasers aren't the best. Um, so what we have here is this is the pull region, so you can see the fiber being pulled out. And what we do is we actually take a, a, along this green line the pixel values, and we monitor the intensity, and we have a PID closed loop control that stabilizes the, the, the power of the laser. So this has improved the performance significantly. So this is the startup power of the laser, the blue, and then the red is the stabilized power. So it really is actually pretty good now. Um, and we've also seen that that kind of feeds into improved um, performance of the fiber strength. So reduced spread. So you can see unstabilized fibers on the right in red, they have a much wider spread than the blue ones. So they're much tighter here around the, the, the higher break points. Um, of course, the scatter is a brittle material, so there's always um, mechanisms that cause fibers to, to become weaker. Um, but the scatter does indeed look smaller as we go to the, to the more stabilized fibers. Again, possibly because we've improved the, uh, the, the dimensional tolerances, we've reduced the, the, the variation in, in the heating. So, uh, so we find that the, the stress in the fiber, the intrinsic stress is, is actually reduced. Um, but we, we're now applying this for, for A plus and, and our, our fibers in, in next generation gravitational wave detectors. Um, so we've upgraded our, our Glasgow machine, and then recently, um, in, back in February, we upgraded the machine that we have in uh, or designed and built in, in Hanford, so where they pull the fibers for, for advanced LIGO and A plus. Um, and that just shows you some final slides, um, just some work that we've been doing on stress corrosion. So. You know, anything has a mean time to failure, um, you know, steel, glass, silicon. Um, and what you find is it's a combination of stress and humidity that causes silica to fail. Um, so this is a plot of stress versus time to failure. So if you hold a fiber at different stresses, how long will it be before it typically breaks? Um, so of course, at very high stress, this can be very short, probably a few seconds, which is the ultimate tensile strength. But then as you go lower and lower stress, then you find that you know three gigapascals, it's maybe 10 hours, and then it breaks. Um, and we've been doing uh, a set of experiments. Um, well, clearly it's 
quite hard to, to do sort of uh, much um, less than this. Um, although we, we, we have got some fibers in the vacuum tank at 1.2 gigapascal. Uh, and this point here um, tells us where we are at the moment. We've been monitoring them for about two years and they haven't broken yet. <laughs> so of course they're sitting there. And then as, as time goes on, this, this green plot goes up. Um, well, we expect that at 1.5, 1.6, it should last 34 years before it starts to break. Um, well, this one here is probably 340 years. So I'm not sure we're going to be measuring that long. Um, and then in advanced LIGO, you'd expect fibers to exist for 6,000 years, and then they might just, just break due to stress corrosion. Um, so it's, it's an interesting sort of uh, fracture mechanics. And, and indeed, these, these fibers do, you know, they, they, they do exhibit a linear trend. The question is, does it remain linear? Um, well, nobody's got any data over, over really long time periods, so we, we, we're just keeping some, some fibers going for, for that. Because if you want to motivate improvements in suspensions for advanced LIGO or A plus by using thinner fibers, you have to prove that they're strong enough. So this, this work to, to, to look at fibers at higher stress and just leave them for several years is actually proving the way forward for next generation gravitational wave suspensions. All right, I'm just about over my 40 minutes, so I think I'll stop there, but I've basically talked about seismic and thermal noise, how we use um, diffuse silica, which is an extremely mature technology. And I think, you know, it's great the work that we're doing on the, the stabilization and the, the really high quality factors in diffuse silica. And I'll finish there, thanks. Uh, thank you, Giles. Questions for Giles, please. Uh, maybe I can ask a, a simple one to kick things off. Um, Giles, when you were talking about the different um, losses from like wells and surface and that kind of stuff, and you said that you put them all into a model to combine them <clears throat> to get the total loss, does the model, I mean, don't go into too much detail about the models, but I was just curious whether it combines these losses um, quad, quadrat, you know, in quadrature or are they correlated in some way and, and that has to be taken into account? Yeah, no, good question. Um, so, so actually, when, when, we, when we think about the fiber, so, so the fiber is kind of changing geometry. Um, so, so the individual loss terms, the surface loss, the thermoelastic, and the weld. So of course, you only get weld loss when you're sitting in the weld region. But as we go into the fiber, and we've got the fiber that's changing shape, then clearly in the, the thick of it, like three millimeters, um, you're going to see less surface loss because you've got um, a higher volume to surface ratio. Um, and you're going to see um, more thermoelastic loss because the thermoelastic loss is not cancelled. Um, so what we do for every section of the fiber, we sort of cut it up into, into beam elements. We do the finite, finite element analysis. We predict the amount of energy stored in each, each of the elements. And then we scale, um, we calculate the, the loss terms for each of those individual terms and sum them up. Um, because actually the empirical model, it's only an empirical model that, that we use, but this has come from you know, many measurements on fused silicon fibers. And it, it looks like you do actually have to add, just add them up straight. Um, so you add just the surface loss plus the thermoelastic, and that seems to fit the, the observed values in, in the best way. Um, and then we, we go through the fiber. Um, so we, 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 of course, scale each of the beam elements by their total energy. Sum all of that up, that gives us total fiber loss, and then we, we put that into the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks, Charles. Um, I saw a hand up from Suresh. Suresh? Hi, Giles. Hi. Hey, Suresh. Uh, your last but one slide when you when you showed the uh, time to break of a fiber. I didn't quite understand why uh, increased strain, oh, sorry, uh, an increased strain, no, no, I understand. So increased strain resulted in uh, shorter lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, so again, this has been observed. Um, this was started off in, in the sort of late 60s by um, people who are really observing fused, um, sort of fused silicon optical fibers. Um, someone called Proctor. Um, so what causes fused silica to break is a combination of humidity. So if you, if you put the fibers in, in, a, in, a, in a more humid atmosphere, then you cause the, the fibers to, to break more often. And that's because the water gets into the silica and starts to affect the silicon oxygen bonds. Um, the other mechanism that causes breakage of fiber is stress. So when fibers operate at higher stress, then they tend to break more, more often. 
Um, partly because, you know, fundamentally you might say, what's the ultimate tensile strength of fusilica? I mean, it's, it's a little bit higher than four gigapascals and, and people have measured up to 10 or 12 gigapascals. And at that point, you're getting to the sort of thermal mechanical breaking. So at some point you start to pull, pull apart the silicon oxygen bonds enough that they just fracture. So, so the, the likelihood of a fiber breaking increases as you put stress on the fiber. So, so what we find is that, you know, partly because you're, you're more sensitive to then, I mean, it might be that you're more sensitive to humidity because as you put the stress higher, then the, any, any water or any surface effect becomes more important. If you've got a surface crack on the fiber, so, so there's different types of surface cracking for silica. So you can have some cracks that are kind of like that. And as, as you pull the fiber apart, then, then you can open up the crack. So these are called Griffiths cracks. Um, so, so this is another reason why, you know, as you start to stress the fiber, because you're starting to open these micro cracks on the surface, um, then that's giving rise to, to failure mechanisms. Because if those cracks open and start to join up, then you get a complete failure of the fiber. So I think that's why that's why there is a, a term that's dependent on the stress because of the, the opening up of the sort of micro cracks on the surface. Uh, does the polishing of the fiber with the laser close these uh, micro cracks? When it, it, it certainly helps. Um, so we see we do see a strong correlation that when we when we we polish, so we, we take a piece of silica, and if you pulled the fiber out of just a straight piece of silica, it really wouldn't be strong at all. Um, because what we what we do find is that it's often the ends of the fiber that break. Um, so we do actually run the laser beam along the fiber to start with to, to try and heal the, the surface cracks. Um, I suspect we, so what we find is that the fibers get stronger the longer you polish. So sometimes we polish for maybe an hour. And if you do for two hours, you see an improvement in the fiber. Um, so, so, so there is something to do with, with healing the cracks on the surface. It's not really understood though, you know, why, why does the pristine part of the fiber still have cracks on the surface? So some people believe it's because when you pull these fibers, there is actually a sort of surface that's got a slightly different property to the internal part of the fuse silica. Um, and, and we see that actually we've started to, to do some measurements of really thin fibers. So, you know, down to five micron. And we find that when we, when we look at thin fibers, we, we find that the, the bulk Young's modulus is not the same as what you'd expect for thick fibers. So for thick fibers, you get 70 gigapascal. As you go thinner, we start to see the Young's modulus change. So, so there is some evidence that there's maybe a, a, a change in the, in the surface property of the, of the silica. Thanks, Jans. Uh, if I may be allowed one more question. Uh, we see that uh, in the future we are going to have uh, much, heavy, much more heavier mirrors. Does that mean that we will move closer to the higher regime? Oh, I didn't catch the first bit, Suresh. Uh, I'm saying that uh, in the future, we are going to have heavier mirrors. Uh, so that, does that mean that uh, we will be moving to the right in the... Uh, uh, um, well, not, not necessarily. So um, we could do. Um, so there are reasons why you want to move to higher stress. So, for example, for A+, one of the things we proposed was um, in the thin section of the fiber, we'll make the fiber thinner because um, that has the benefit that it moves that bounce mode at nine hertz, it moves it down in frequency. So you can, if, you, if you go up to 1.2, 1 1.5 gigapascals, you can push that down to seven hertz. So get that out of the band, because at 10 hertz, it can be rather annoying. So, so making a thinner fiber operating at higher stress in, in the midsection is good. Um, it also pushes up the violin mode frequencies. So they can go up to 650, 700 hertz. Um, at the end of the fibers, you, you'd still operate around 200 megapascal. So in LIGO, we have 800 microns, um, and that ensures that, that at the bending region of fiber, the thermoelastic noise is cancelled. So what you do for heavier optics is you, you scale up that end of the fiber. So in, in our test we have in Glasgow, we've got 140 kilogram suspension hanging. And at the end of the fiber, it's 1.2 millimeters rather than 800 microns, and that's to get the thermoelastic cancellation. But in the midsection of the fiber, we make it a little bit thinner. So we, we up the stress in, in the midpoint, and that's to lower the bounce mode up, up, up the violin modes. So you do a combination. You would operate at higher stress in the midsection, but at the end where all the bending occurs, you still need to, to cancel the thermoelastic loss. 
Thanks, Jazz. Okay, um, we have two more questions, one from Martin, and if that's brief, hopefully we can have taken, squeeze in the last question. Go ahead, Martin. Martin, if you're talking, we can't, okay. Hi, George, sorry, just unstable internet. I think it's brief. Um, uh, yeah, just a quick follow up to yours, really. So, Giles, I'm um, doing the summing over the finite elements. Um, what sort of determines the size that, well, I guess computationally, you know, there's a limit to how many elements you can handle, but are you confident that they're all independent of each other when, when you sum the contributions? Yeah, so, so we, we, we're limited by um, typically what finite element program that, that we, we use, it doesn't like it when, when elements change um, and get beyond a, a certain aspect ratio. So if you make those elements really thin, but yep. quite wide, that, that typically breaks down. So that's one limit we have to be quite careful ah, with. Um, I think yeah, you, you, you bring out another interesting point and something we, we, we haven't quite done properly, and this is an interesting problem that I'd always wanted to solve, um, is, is actually we, we think about the thermoelastic loss so the heat flow across the fiber I think we think about it in quite a simplistic way. So we assume that you know when that fiber bends backwards and forwards, the heat just flows directly yeah. across. And, and I think that's a little bit of a simplification because um, in reality, it's going to be a much more complex thermal field because as the fiber kind of changes geometry, I think you might find that the heat flow kind of doesn't go directly across, ah, but yes. maybe goes uh -huh. the shortest path. Yeah. So I think that, that is a simplification yeah. that we're not considering at the moment. Um, but I think there's enough okay. um, kind of... You know, we, we have enough um, kind of free space between the thermoelastic that even a change of five to ten percent wouldn't hurt us. But to get the best estimate, right. I think we'd want to think a little bit more in detail about where does the heat flow really go in thermoelastic. Well, I'd be interested to talk more about that. I think I'd be, you know, just kind of solving the relevant PDE and and seeing what difference it makes. Right, yeah. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah, could be a nice project. Um, okay, one last quick question from Timesh. Yeah, hi, can I be heard? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm just curious, what, uh, what's the, what would be the effect of a, a cryogenic interferometer in terms of improving the thermal noise? Is it better to target sort of the mechanical losses or uh, is cryogenic uh, a good way of getting a big improved performance mm -hmm. thermal loss? Yeah, yeah no, good, good question. Um, well, well, both in the way. So clearly for, for fused silica, um, you know, Let's take the Einstein telescope, which has both cryogenic and room temperature. So, so if you wanted to push for room temperature an instrument, that's typically a higher frequency instrument. Um, so what we do there is we up the masses, make the suspension longer, operate at room temperature, um, and, and that actually provides the, the, the required performance for you know, above maybe, maybe 100 hertz. Um, if you want to go for low frequency instrument where suspension thermal noise is really a challenge, then you're, you're really pushing to, to, to lower temperature operation, partly because, as we saw earlier, you know, there's so much you can do for, 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 for managing that KT of energy. So you need to go to cryogenic at some point. Um, so you know, 120 is an interesting operating point for if you operate with silicon. So that's interesting that you have to change the material because pure silicon is great at room temperature, doesn't work well at low temperature because it's, it's an amorphous material. So you have to move over to crystalline material. So there's a lot of work going on, um, certainly in Glasgow and, and others around the world, um, of developing silicon and sapphire suspensions. And of course, we've got CAGRA that's operating at the moment, at, you know, 18 Kelvin, and that uses crystalline sapphire. And the, the idea of using the cryogenic suspension is you, you work both to reduce the temperature, but also some of these crystalline materials have extremely low mechanical loss at, at, at cryogenic temperatures. And even better, silicon, it has zero thermal expansion at 120 Kelvin. So that means you can cancel thermoelastic loss. So one of the reasons you might hear sometimes people say, well, let's operate, you know, LIGO Voyager at 120 Kelvin is because you can actually cancel thermoelastic. So, so there's a lot of interest in cryogenics, but it's pretty tough because as soon as you start cooling materials, you know, the thermal effects, the stress effects, the thermal cycling, the fact that things change a lot in, in low temperature, take a long time to cool down. These are all challenges that we, we're sort of wrestling with in the, in the community over the next uh, few years. But it's certainly something that's coming and, and CAGRA is really sort of pioneering the way.
Okay, I see no more questions. Um, so I think we need to move on to uh, some items for uh, the great network for discussion. Thanks again, Giles, for your very interesting seminar, uh, webinar. Um, so 